welcome along to this week's writer's routine where our guest taking us through the secrets of his writing day is Tom McRae. Tom wrote the book and the lyrics for the phenomenally successful West End musical Everybody's Talking About Jamie. Uh, we chat about how he went from having an idea to then it being played on a proper West End stage in just four years. Also, we hear how he writes dialogue when he knows that there's a song just creeping around the corner and we learn about the difference between writing for novels, screen, and on the stage. On screen, you cannot mess around. Every line has to really earn its place. But on stage, actually, I think that's why writers often like it, is you don't have that same pressure. But that can lead to a sloppiness and to a laziness and to an audience kind of shuffling in their seat whilst they watch how clever you're being. And I didn't want to do that, so I was really strict with myself about not wasting any dialogue. So if it feels targeted like that, I guess it's because I'm incredibly aware of my audience. Stick around, it's a really good, detailed, nugget-full episode, this one, with Tom McRae in this week's Writer's Routine. Yes, hello, welcome along. This is Writer's Routine, the show where we take a little sneak peek through the working days of some of our most successful writers. Uh, This week, we've got something else that's a little bit different. Uh, We had uh, a non-fiction writer, Tim Smedley. He was on the show last time out, uh, taking us through uh, his journey to find out what's really going on with air pollution and how he wrote a non-fiction science book. We're going from that to something that's different in a completely different way to what we're used to. We're chatting to the writer of a hit West End music this week we've got Tom McRae on the show Tom has written for telly mostly comedy there's some Doctor Who in there as well but he's probably now best known for the book and the lyrics uh, for Everybody's Talking About Jamie which is based on the BBC documentary Jamie Drag Queen at 16 I think is what it's called it's all about a boy from Sheffield who wanted to wear a dress to his high school prom Uh, And then it's all about how that went down in a particularly traditional working class city. So you've got everything that's going on in there, all the tension between him and his mum and his dad and his friends at school who are on his side, but also uh, need to play up to the usual stereotypes of what happens when you're at high school. And all of that is chucked in the same place. And it's absolutely ripe uh, for a properly brilliant feel good musical. I've got the dreams, I've got the style, I've got the moves to make you smile, so kiss my ass goodbye, cause I'm gonna be the one, I'm on my way, I won't return, just stupid lessons I've ever learned, and I'll be free to fly, and I'm gonna kiss the sun. Now, we talked to Tom about how it happened, about how he knew that he wanted to write a musical, how he finally got the green light, got the idea to make it happen, and what he did when he had that initial idea. We also talk about the writing days where he and his co-writer, Dan Gillespie Sells, uh, locked themselves away uh, in a chateau somewhere in France, I think, to get all the songs done. Uh, We also chat about how he massively brackets up his writing and his work time to make sure that he can switch off and not be distracted distracted and i'll be honest with you right now uh, last week i think i said about how i sometimes find it a struggle uh, to do these interviews when there's something a little bit different a, a little bit outside of the normal comfort zone of fiction authors that we chat to but this week tom was just fantastic uh, it, he was just really good at getting to the nub of what the secret of his writing is. He did it very quickly. Uh, He gave us loads of brilliant advice, loads of top tips, really did fine comb through his working day. So listen closely. There's a lot to pick up on in here. Uh, As we catch up with the working day of Tom McRae on Writer's Routine, and we start, as always, with what he sees around him in the place where he sits down to work. I have an office at home, which I work in, uh, and I like to have a mostly clear desk I have a big desk but with some stuff on it that makes me feel like I'm at home so I have like some knickknacks and some uh, like a photo of uh, me and my nan I think I've got in the corner and um, just just stuff I've always sort of had on my different desks in different houses so it always feels like it's the same space but um, but I have uh, a room that is just an office for working and I don't use it for anything else so I can kind of keep the work life and the home life separate even though I'm working in the same building Aside from the, the knickknacks and memories you've got around you, is there anything else? Uh, um, is there a view that looks out upon something? Have you got bookshelves lined? Yeah, I, I don't have actually that many books because um, I live in Los Angeles and I didn't take much stuff with me when I moved out because I've still got my house in London, which has got so much stuff in it. So 
there's only really the books that I've kind of come across for work that are there. Everything else I have on my iPad. So I sort of stopped buying physical books a while ago unless it was something I particularly needed. Um, but I have uh, a nice view. Um, we've got a pool in the back garden and I kind of look at that. Uh, and it's not distracting, but it's very pretty. Uh, I wouldn't want to have too good a view, I guess, because then I just sit and gaze at it. But it's nice to have something. So you can, there's the, the, my office door exits directly onto a kind of veranda by the pool. So I can open the door and the, get the sort of the, the sun and the heat and the nice sounds in uh, and just kind of focus on what I'm doing. Very quickly, away, aside from writing, I'm just always curious when, when people have pools, do you swim in it a lot? I, I Yeah, at lunchtime, Great. I get in the pool. Uh, it, it's just practical because it's so hot. So uh, it's nice just to cool off. And it's a good, it's sort of good thinking time. But actually, I, I go running a lot and I find that's the best thinking time because it's sort of repetitive and actually quite monotonous. Whereas swimming, um, I don't know, for some reason, I kind of just focus on more what I'm doing. Whereas if I'm running, I completely zone out. And I, I used to write all the lyrics when I was off running around. And if I have to figure out plot points, um, I'll do it when I'm running. It's the best place to, to sort out story conundrums well thank you for getting back to the writing just lastly on the room if i were to walk in when you're you know heads down in the middle of everybody's talking about jamie would i see any signs as to what you were writing all around you you talk about plot points are there no no none of that it's all in my head I, i i know some writers do the whole kind of cards on the wall thing i it does absolutely nothing for me i've i just keep it all in my head and the show is called Writer's Routine, Tom. So talk to me about yours. The moment you wake up to the moment you go to yep. bed on a day when you are sitting down to write, talk me through the whole thing. It might seem boring to you, but I promise yeah, yeah, it isn't no, no, to okay. us. So, well, I'm, so I'm, I'm filming at the moment. Like Literally, we're shooting the Jamie movie. So I, I don't have a normal routine at the moment. But my normal routine when I'm not actually in uh, production is I don't set an alarm. I wake up naturally. It's often quite late because I'm not very good in the morning. But I try to be... Uh, to be sitting down at my desk by 10.30 and I don't do anything creative in the morning. I just do emails, phone calls. If I've got any meetings, I do all that in the morning and get that out of the way. And then I'll go for a run before lunch and then eat lunch or have a swim. And then I sit down from 2.30 till 5 and that's my writing time. And I don't look at any emails after lunch uh, unless they're really emergencies because I don't want to get distracted. And plus, I'm kind of living across two time zones if I'm getting stuff from the UK and the US. So it's all like literally all through the night I'd be getting emails anyway. Uh, and I just focus on what I'm writing. And so I'll, one of the good things about doing kind of the boring stuff in the morning is that in the back of my head, I'll be kind of ticking over what I was doing the day before, what I've got to figure out next. If I've got a meeting and I'm sitting outside an office waiting to go in or just in an Uber or, or whatever it is, it's all good thinking time. So that when I actually sit down, I know what I'm going to write. And I type really fast. I learned to touch type when I was 16. So I can type like 120 words a minute, whatever it is. And that's the admin. The actual putting the words on the page is the admin. But all the real work is is thinking about what you're going to do. So I finish dead on five. Even if I'm in the middle of a scene, I finish at five. Because if I'm like, oh, I just want to finish that, that means that by the next day, I'll be really keen to crack on with it. And having that kind of enthusiasm for what I'm doing means that I can be as productive as I am. So those two and a half hours, if as, as you say, it's admin time, really. You're just getting the words down that are almost yeah. fully formed in your head. How often do you find yourself being a bit stifled by creativity and actually struggling to get those words down? Uh, no, I don't. If, if, I, if I get stuck, I just stop and I'll look at a YouTube video or read something on Wikipedia or look at the news or look at Instagram, just something that takes a couple of minutes and I'll be doing that and I'll suddenly go, oh, that's how to fix it. So the problem is if you get stuck is not to try and stare at the problem and get writer's block is you literally walk away from it. Uh, and I mean, sometimes like literally I'll go and go into another room or go and do something completely different and that it, you always figure it out. Um, always, always, always. So I, I think if you try and push it, you can get stuck. But if you just let your subconscious kind of take the strain, uh, it will figure out what you need to do next aside from that that method of helping your writer's block are there any other tips and tricks that you've learned along the way that really helps you get stuff down in those two and a half hours um just don't mess around like just work so i don't in the morning i might be looking at you know all kinds of nonsense online or uh you know just catching up with friends or you know like fun stuff but not productive but for the those two and a half hours i i really just get my head down and i work and if you know you're going to finish at five 
and it gets to four and you haven't really kind of got enough down, then you know you've got an hour and it makes you focus and it makes you get on with it. When I first started out, before I'd figured out how to have this routine, I might step all night and I'd, you know, drink red wine and smoke and which I, and I still drink, but not when I'm working, but I don't smoke anymore. But kind of feel like I was, you know, reinventing the wheel and discovering the story and these characters and all immersed. But I burn out after a few days. And what I realized was if you keep office hours, it will be at my version of office hours, then you know you've got to stop at five. So you don't mess around between 4.30 and five. Like you might, there might be the most productive time because you know I've only got half an hour and I've got to get everything done. And then you finish with maybe the scene's not complete, but you know what you're going to do. And then the next morning I'm like, oh, I can't wait to get writing in the afternoon. And then you sit down, it's like a joy um, rather than a chore. I, I, I really enjoy the process of writing. Uh, and partly it's because I don't actually spend that long doing it and I have a proper social life in the evening and then I'm always looking forward to getting back to it the next day. You mentioned routine there and also earlier on that because you're in the middle of shooting the movie things are a bit you know up in the air right now in terms of your writing but how many days do you tend to get down to it is it a five day a week five thing? day a week I never work at weekends and I don't look at emails at weekends so weekends are properly separate and sacred I don't go on holiday very often because I really like what I'm doing and I don't really want to stop doing it but weekends are complete downtime so if I get sent an email on Friday afternoon I won't reply to it or look at it till Monday morning my friend Dan Gillespie Sells and I had talked about working on a musical and we started writing some songs together um, and I was writing lyrics for the first time which was really exciting Dan's a really accomplished composer um, but he hadn't written for the theatre before so to have that kind of narrative structure was new to him and lyrics were completely new to me and we wrote some songs and we had a kind of idea for a show and we were advised by a friend of ours to go and watch all the musicals that were on at the time as kind of research because we're both I probably like musicals more than Dan does, but both of us are kind of... We, we don't just love a show because it's a musical. In fact, we're kind of probably more critical of it. And there's many, many, many musicals that we really don't like. So we're kind of like critical friends to the genre. Uh, and there's ones that we both love and, and, you know, would, you know, want to see a million times. But we're not like so died in the wall fans that because it's a musical we automatically love it and often quite the reverse if it's too stagey so we were going to watch all these shows and we liked some of them we didn't like other ones and when we went to see uh, kiss me kate at the uh, at chichester we were going back in at the end of the interval before act two started and we sort of literally bumped into michael ball um, and his wife going back in and michael recognized dan because his band the feeling had been on michael's radio show and at the time i had a sitcom on comedy central which michael really liked uh, and so we got talking to him and he sort of took us under his wing a bit and said, well, come and see me in Sweeney Todd. He was doing at the West End. So we went to see that and then we kind of hung out with him afterwards. And then a little while later we had dinner and he said, you should do like a sh kind of a showcase of the songs that you've written. So Dan has this lovely recording studio in Hackney. And so we put on a little show for about 15 people. We invited just kind of industry people that we knew or that people we knew knew. Uh, a friend of ours played piano and me and Dan sang these songs and at the end Michael said I think you might have something but you need to work with a director to kind of put it together um, and I've been working with a guy called Jonathan Butterell on my one man show so Michael introduced us to Jonathan and we met him and we played the songs we'd written um, and Jonathan said yeah I'd like to help you make this into something that could be something there but what we didn't realise was that Jonathan just literally a few weeks before had seen the documentary uh, Jamie Drag Queen at 16 which inspired the show and he'd gone and spoken to the Crucible in Sheffield about um, doing an original piece there and had kind of got a tentative green light to go ahead and develop it and was looking for writers and hadn't been able to find anyone who was right and when he met us he just straight away thought these are the guys so kind of a week or two later was Dan's birthday and we invited Jonathan to that and um, and he said to me I wasn't going to talk about work but I've got this idea and I, he, he explained the documentary, which I hadn't seen, but I was aware of. I kind of knew the rough outline of it. And I thought it was a great idea. And, and then we started writing it. Um, well, I wrote, obviously, the, the, the screen, not the screenplay, the stage play, I should say. And then we went off to, uh, to France and stayed in the Gite for kind of like 10 days and broke down what we thought the songs would be. And actually wrote He's My Boy, which is the big song. At least Dan wrote the melody while we were there. I wrote the lyrics when we got back. And it all just kind of fell into place really easily. That first draft is pretty much what is on stage, at, you know, at 7.30 every night and pretty much is what the movie is as well. So for your showcase, that must have been quite storyless. You know, these are just random songs that are well, just th there. No, there was, there was a narrative that... So I, all I really knew about musicals was um, the... Uh, 
I had a CD of Mary Poppins soundtrack that had as a kind of a bonus feature, like a 30 minute interview with the Sherman Brothers as the final track. And they said when they were doing Mary Poppins, they used to go around and write all these songs and, and they were trying to, Walt Disney was figuring out the story and they'd say, oh, there's a nice bit in the books about a woman who sells um, uh, crumbs on the steps of St. Paul. So they kind of wrote this song about her. And then they had this idea that maybe the dad would sort of be the villain, but in the end he'd be rehabilitated. And so they wrote the kite song and all this sort of stuff. And then they built the story from these songs as building blocks. So Dan and I thought, oh, that's what you do. You just, you kind of roughly know what your story is and your characters, and then you write a load of songs. So we did that. So it was all the wrong way around. And what Jonathan said was, you need to just write the the play first. Uh, so our original idea, which did involve a drag element, we've, we've never pursued any further. And, and I, I wouldn't do it now because, you know, Jamie sort of took up that space. Um, I, I'm not just going to write drag musicals the rest of my life. So uh, so the, it, it kind of got us there. But you know, we, there was a narrative. So we sort of sang the songs and I sort of talked through the story. Um, it's just we hadn't quite figured out how to approach it in the right way. When you've had this discussion with the director, you know, he's going to put this on at the Crucible. This is before you've gone to France. Kind of what's the very first thing that you then did? You finally got this idea. Yeah. You've got an outlet for your musical uh, creativity. How did you sit there and suddenly think, right, we've got this story. I've seen the documentary now. Let's yeah. put it on the Well, page. I guess we, we, I suppose I watched the documentary. I don't remember now, but I must have done. And then we came up to the Crucible to watch. They did a production of Oliver for their Christmas show, like I guess four years ago it was. And I hadn't been to the crucible before so we went out to have a look and as we were there for the day uh we got them to lend us we ended up in the wig room we just said could we have a space but they gave us the wig room and we sat down and i took out four pieces of paper um two pieces of paper for act one two pieces of paper for act two and went through and broke it up into scenes because i wasn't really used to doing scenes in that way like the the stage show i think has about 19 scenes in the whole production in the movie 19 scenes doesn't get you to page nine you know film eats up the kind of real estate of the scene you very rarely write a scene that's more than three pages long that is kind of generally the maximum unless there's a really good reason whereas on stage there's like 15 16 17 page scenes uh and i wasn't used to the kind of the grammar of that so um if if i was going to write a scene where two people are talking in a school and actually we shot this scene the other day for the movie i have them they talk in a classroom and then they walk out and they walk down the corridor and then they go into another room and then they go into the canteen and they get served food and they walk over and sit at the table and they're having this conversation but you keep it moving because it's more interesting and by queuing up for food they can have a bit of banter with the dinner lady and there's all kind of ways of making it feel alive in a stage show they walk into a room and they stay in that room and if you want to have other characters the other characters walk into that room as well so jonathan the director said because I was like, oh, so they're in the room and they're talking and then they, they walk out into the corridor. And it's like, well, that's now a new scene if they walk into a corridor. I was like, oh, OK. So you've got to keep them in this space and have people kind of pop in, which felt really fake when I was first doing it because I think, oh, that's not how it works because it's not how it works on film. But actually in real life, it, it is most of the time you sort of sit in a room and people pop in. Uh, so it was kind of like figuring out how to do all that stuff. And by getting these bits of paper and just drawing it out as a kind of a map it let me understand this is how you tell a story on stage uh and i still have those four pieces of paper and in that moment i was like oh the character he's called hugo i picked a name of a, a friend of mine which i thought would be fun for him and there's a club called legs 11 and it all just off the top of my head kind of pulling this together but i needed to sort of run it by a director who would understand it and say you can't really do that or oh yeah do that um and then i just sat down and wrote it and just made it up like i always do <laughs> I think you have to know the ending before you do anything else. Uh, and although the documentary gave us an ending to an extent, which is Jamie goes to his prom in the dress and he's ultimately let in, that is plot more than story. Um, what do you mean by that, that difference? Can you just talk us through so that? So plot is the king dies, then the queen dies. Story is the king dies, then the queen dies of a broken heart. That's the difference. And you want story. Plot enables you to have story, but plot on its own is cold. Um, and if, if stuff's badly written, it's, it's just plot. It's just, and then this happened, and then this happened, and then this happened. And then he, the genie appeared and fixed it in the end. You know, um, to have story, you've got to really get into the consequences and the conflicts and the dynamics. And, and to a certain extent, I don't know who the characters are until I start writing them. They, they kind of come into my head as I'm typing. Uh, one of the advantages of being able to type really quickly is that I can type as quick as I can think. So I, I just let that happen. But when we workshopped it initially, even when we had the very first unofficial read-through with some friends, I remember a few people were saying to us, oh, you're so, you've, you've written Act 1 and Act 2. 
I said, what do you mean? And I said, well, people often just workshop act one. I said, but if you don't know the ending, how do you know the beginning? How can you know what act one is unless you've written act two? It's not, it shouldn't be a mystery to me. It can be mysterious and surprising to the audience, but I shouldn't be surprised by it. I need to be in control of it. So I'd always know, I always work out the ending first and then pl- plot backwards from that to the beginning and then everything fits together nicely. How, how much of the rest of the story were you in control of at that point? Uh, well, we decided collectively, I suppose sort of led by me knowing that I was going to write it, where each scene would take place. Because the practicalities of doing a scene change on stage is it takes time, uh, it's expensive because you've got to have a set that will move around. And once you've done it, you need to stay there for a bit. You can't jump cut from scene to scene to scene like on stage. Uh, so, so like on screen. Um, so so I needed to, to make sure that you know we, we weren't uh, just throwing in sets for no reason. You know, if we established the schoolroom, can we use the schoolroom a few times? You know, if we establish the kitchen of the mum's house, can we use that a few times? Uh, to make sure that, that it was kind of achievable to kind of physically move around the world in this way. But having done that, I'd, I'd know what the scene had to do. I'd know the job of it, where it had to get to in the next scene. But how you get there, the fun for me is just to sit down and write. And I was talking about this with Jonathan, the director, because we're staying in the same flat whilst we shoot the movie. Um, talking about this yesterday, actually. I was saying how that thing of having experience and the instinct it gives you, which actually is something you've earned rather than something that just sort of pops out of your, your soul. But that I, if I'm writing a scene and I know I've got to get from point A to point B and I'm writing some dialogue and I can just suddenly tell, oh, this tangent I've gone on, this is nice, the dialogue, but this is going to take three or four exchanges to get me to where it actually needs to go. And there's a version where I can just do one exchange that will leap from the subject matter they're on there to the subject matter I want them to be on. And I don't need to spend time here. There's no point. So, and I'd kind of retrace up the page and delete dialogue to go back to the point. Like, do you remember those um, Choose Your Own Adventure books mm. where it's like, do you drink from the goblet turn to 72 do you cut the goblin's throat turn to page 33 and it's like that you hit a point and you're like well the character says this where were you last night well I, was, I went out well what do you mean out and you start to and think actually maybe it's just better they don't say where were you last night because that has to be answered and that answer opens up questions and I don't need those questions what if they just say oh I was knackered last night oh me too I went to bed early and then you've, you've cut through it unless you want to spend time with that conversation but it's sort of like there's an instinct that makes me go, this is just treading water uh, that will get me on to the next point. But the actual fun of it is to sit down and just see what happens. Well, let me pick that apart because what was in, uh, immediately evident when I sat down to watch Jamie uh, was the efficiency of, of the dialogue. Oh, thank you. So, you, you know, you, you sit there, you immediately know really what's going on in the first half of the first scene where they're talking about what career they want to have when they grow yeah, up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How much thought are you giving to making sure every single line that you are writing, everything anyone says, uh, has a purpose and is driving this this force along? Yeah, I, I don't like to waste dialogue. Um, I mean, you actually can on stage because it dialogue is action pretty much in the theatre. I mean, I, I try to make sure every scene has at least one bit of strong visual storytelling. So like when Jamie tries to climb out the window in the toilet, I mean, it doesn't do anything, but I put that in because I knew it would be funny. And I knew I could play off the idea of, you know, how that would work. Or even when Dean goes to punch him and Jamie Jamie just kisses him. Uh, Or turning up in the ridiculous dress that then lights up just to illustrate. It's a dress that never gets worn, but to illustrate the point of where, where his head is going, to try and find visual ways of telling it. But in the most part, on stage dialogue is action. Um, so you kind of have to not be too self-indulgent because it's a form that actually encourages you to write speeches. And in Jamie, there's only two speeches. One where Pretty takes down the bully, which I always wanted to have. That's a sort of a very special moment to me. And the other one where Jamie reminisces about his uh, what his dad did when he was a kid that kind of scarred him. And in the movie, I took that speech out and turned it into an actual flashback because that's what it is on stage. If we could have had a, a six-year-old actor in every night, I think I would have staged it as an actual flashback, but that wasn't a practical thing we could have done. But in suddenly writing for the forum for the first time where you're allowed to write all these big speeches, I didn't let myself do it because you get self-indulgent really fast. On screen, you cannot mess around. Every line has to really earn its place. But on stage, actually, I think that's why writers often like it is you don't have that same pressure. But that can lead to a sloppiness and to a laziness and to an audience kind of shuffling in their seat whilst they watch how clever you're being. And I didn't want to do that. So I was really strict with myself about not wasting any dialogue. So if it feels 
targeted like that, I guess it's because I'm incredibly aware of my audience. And also, when we opened Jamie at the Crucible, they did some audience research, and it nearly 40% of our audience had never been to the theatre before. And we reached out to a community that doesn't feel represented or engaged with what's going on on stage. And I don't know if that is true of the West End show. I don't think anyone's checked, but we do have deliberately low priced seats on sale every single night by you know loads of them because we wanted the kids who have supported the show and made it work to still be able to come and see it unlike other shows which actually price a potential audience out um unless there's like a lottery you know we actually just have reasonably priced seats because kids respond to let me rephrase that but I'm, i'm really conscious of what i think an audience will tolerate before you lose them. And I want to keep everyone on their toes. What don't they tolerate, do you think? What won't they tolerate? Speeches. <laughs> yeah. Like, you, I think you can, you can get away with one. Um, and then it should be... It's also about creating community. So the, uh, the kids... There's no ensemble in Jamie. And the author's note in, the, in the, the script, or whatever it's called, you know, the actual published play text that's out there, which I wrote. Obviously, I wrote the play, and I wrote the note, was saying there's no ensemble in this. Sometimes the kids move as an ensemble... Um, and in the dance numbers, they can literally move as an ensemble, but they're all individual characters. So in the opening scene where they're all in class and they're all like bouncing around with all that dialogue, it does, well, it does two things. Firstly, it means that every one of those kids has an identity so that when we meet them at the very end where they all come out in protest of Jamie, it's not just an amorphous blob of kids. It's actually, it's Mickey and it's Vicky and it's Saeed and it's, it's characters you've got to know. So they all, even if they only have a couple of lines, they're, they're carefully kind of thought through to make those characters feel alive. Um, and secondly, we don't open with a song. Jamie, as a musical, is unusual because it's, it's actually far more dialogue than it is singing. I, I think it's probably about 70% dialogue to 30% singing. Uh, and most musicals will probably be literally the other way around. Uh, so we didn't open with a song, we open with dialogue. It plays like a song. We always say to the actors, there's a rhythm to it. Just go fast, trust the dialogue. It's, it's kind of like music. And then you go into a song later because we kind of establish a world that is... It's like a kind of like a like you get on uh, Grange Hill at its best back in the day. Kids being loud and naughty and funny and disruptive and brilliant, and the teacher trying to control them and all that. Who's going to what party? Can he get cigarettes? Blah blah blah. Be quiet, year eleven, and you know all that kind of energy going round takes you into a world that isn't like you could have opened with a song that's like the Happy Villagers song, where it's like <laughs> we're all at school and we're all naughty and we've got big dreams, but we're all going to get crushed. Da 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 da, and that would be a different show, and you'd have. Some kind of established a contract with the audience that that would be a different show and we wanted it to be more edgy and current so just open with dialogue and make the kids sound like real kids that decision then the decision to make it edgy and current how considered was that the whole way through are you there literally brainstorming what makes a musical edgy and current how can we take this left when everyone thinks we're going to go right if i was writing this 15 years ago then i may well have done that I just don't need to do it anymore. It's, the instinct's just, it's too well honed. Um, from all the terrible screenplays I wrote and all the awful mistakes I made, uh, I, I figured out how to just, I, it's like coming up with a joke. I don't know how it, it happens, it just does. I just sit down and think, what's funny about this? And then something kind of eventually pops into my head. Uh, I don't really know how it works, but it does. And I don't question it, I trust it. Before we get back into today's chat, I want to very quickly point you in the direction again of our Patreon page. If you're enjoying the show, particularly today's episode with Tom, if you're getting loads of tips and tidbits, little nuggets of help for your writing, if you've had any advice in the last 70 episodes which has helped the way that you tell stories and get your ideas down onto paper, uh, then please do help us out as well by pledging just a couple of dollars a month over at patreon.com forward slash writers routine. You don't go away empty handed as well as these episodes either. We've got bad we've got bookmarks we've got ways that you can get specially made episodes just for you where some of the authors that we have on this show will answer only your questions 
It's so simple for you to do, takes just a couple of minutes and it only costs a couple of dollars every month. The price of a cup of coffee. It's just a way to help us carry on bringing you these episodes as often with some of the biggest names that we can. And it also helps me buy them a coffee while we're having a chat. I'd love you for doing it. It takes just a couple of seconds by pledging to help and support the show over at patreon.com forward slash writers routine. Also, again, very quickly, I've got another way that you can help us. Sorry to lumber you with these today. The thing is that I'm always being sent messages and tweets from people who have bought books based on the chats that they've heard on this show, which is fantastic. The authors love that. The publishers love it. I love it that you're um, enjoying what we're doing so much. And I want to see a bit more of that on my end. So what I've done, I've set up a little link where if you buy books through it, uh, the show gets a little kickback, just a tiny slither of a percentage, but every little helps. And and the best part is it doesn't cost you any more. doesn't take any money away from the publisher or the author. All it does is take money off the big guys. So if you want to fight back, you know, and help with the show, um, you can do that. I mean, obviously, I'd always direct you to try and buy books in person from independent bookshops local to where you live. But if you can't do that, if you you are forced to buy it online, please do it through the link that I've set up. Uh, I'll, I'll tweet it out every now and then. So keep your eyes peeled over at Writers Pod on Twitter. And I'll also put it in the episode description for each one. So have a look in there. If you do enjoy the chats that we bring you and you want to buy those books, you can do it really easily uh, through our links and help the show. Let's get back into it then with our special guest on this week's Writer's Routine, Tom McRae, who wrote the book and the lyrics uh, for the hit West End musical, Everybody's Talking About Jamie. Now, we talk about the lyrics in this half and how he works jokes into them, how he manages to cram really funny lines into songs. We also talk about words and thesauruses and how he copes with actors interpreting his words in their own way. And we pick things up chatting about everything else that comes into play when you're writing a script, because no longer is it just in someone's head. You've got the blank canvas and the unlimited possibilities of someone's imagination. It has to be more practical when you're writing a script. It has to be made on the stage. So how does that factor into the way that he tells the story? I've never produced theatre, but I've produced a lot of television. So when I'm writing for the screen, I'm automatically aware of the consequences of doing a night exterior in the rain and what that means for production and but I wouldn't overthink all of that because there'll be plenty of people doing that for you later once you actually start to budget it and figure it and when you put it in front of an audience and you go well they they, why the audience why do they keep not laughing at that joke that's funny why is the audience wrong every night and after a bit of time you have to go no okay the audience is right and the joke's not not there uh and it's I, I wouldn't I just wouldn't worry too much about all the other stuff because when you're writing, nothing else exists yet. So what you'll put down is going to create the kind of the template and mood that the designers and everyone else is going to go from. I mean, I think with stage directions, I don't read a lot of people's screenplays, to be honest, but when I do, sometimes they have these like amazing flouncy stage directions and it just seems like such a waste because no one ever reads them. Like sometimes... If you really want to set a mood, it's worth actually going into a bit of kind of proper prose to describe the feel of a scene. But otherwise, I would do like, John walks into the room, he sees the desk, he walks over to the desk, he sits down at the desk. If I was writing a novel or something, I'd find three different words for desk. But when it's a screenplay, and if I establish there's a desk, which means the props, well, the, 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 the designers need to know there's a desk, and the actors want to know there's a desk, let's just call it the desk, and then we all know we're talking about the desk. <laughs> so I, I, I don't want to be... I'm not trying to entertain people with stage directions unless sometimes I remember a screenplay I wrote where I opened describing the storm and I went into full on poetry because it really made the world it really sold the world to the reader Um, but that's something I do very rarely for specific reasons now even though you want to be edgy you know and your natural instinct is to be alternative when writing when you are working on a musical the simple convention is that music and lyrics need to drive a whole lot of the plot yeah uh, talk to me about wh- when you are writing a scene and you're building up to that moment where you know, jamie's mum's going to break out into song how, how much that is affecting the, the lines that you're writing knowing that this is coming along i, I guess it's at what point are you writing each thing? I think we'll start with this. Yeah. So when are you writing the music and lyrics? When are you writing the book? How much does that work together? Well, with Jamie, we, we had a 
fairly clear idea going in of what we thought the songs would be and about 50% of those if not more actually probably other songs that we have in the show now so like he's my boy is a line in the documentary and we always knew we were going to have a song called he's my boy but actually it went in act one and it was just a kind of more of a like margaret the mum saying ah you know kids will be kids kind of thing and we wrote this song and then when we first performed it it was just down at the piano singing in front of a group of our friends um who were doing a, a reading for us just everyone playing different characters the, the, it was like the room just stopped after that song and i looked around and everyone was in tears and dan and i and jonathan were like oh this needs to go now too this is this is the big song we didn't realize that it was the big song let me cut in quickly just to ask you about that um you know before you start writing and, and you, you mentioned earlier how you've watched so many musicals and almost analyzed what makes them good what makes them not so good yeah do, do you did you give a lot of thought or how much thought did you give to the placing of each song so we need to open although we're going to open with dialogue yeah. in that first scene we're going to have a big upbeat tune that gets everyone involved that establishes characters in act two we need a sad song to really drive home the message yeah how much thought did you give to at what point each songs were coming and what they would be uh, i mean well, loads because it's like p- p- people ask dan and i what comes first the musical the lyrics and the answer is the idea and actually what makes a song work isn't the music or the lyrics it's about having the right song in the right place because you can have the most perfect melody with the wrong words or the most perfect words with the wrong melody but you can have the most perfect melody with the most perfect words and like he's my boy put it in the wrong place and it's just thrown away or it doesn't really serve the function you want it to so working out where songs go and how you get into them what's the line of dialogue before is there a line of dialogue before i mean uh, when pretty sings spotlight to jamie which is where she says to him you know just be who you are now don't be scared why don't you just do this brave thing well there was a very early version i'm trying to remember now but i think where she sort of um in her talk to get him into the song she says something along the lines of you know you could just you could just turn up and be brave and be yourself and then she sang the song and then you sort of look at it and go well by saying you can turn up and be brave and be yourself you don't need to sing the song because in that she's just said everything the song says so actually the song comes out of not a non sequitur, but it comes, it, she just starts singing it because leading it in too much, the dialogue had done all the work the song was going to do. So you have to be, you have to really sort of think about how you transition from the world of dialogue to the world of music. And that's actually, I think, the hardest thing to get right. It's, it's the most invisible thing when it works. I don't think anyone would really think about it, but I think as a, as a collective three, because the three of us are the creators of the show, we probably spent more time worrying about and planning those transitions than we did anything else. When you sat there with Dan, when you've escaped to France to write this music, can you try and describe to me what days were like there? I don't, I don't, you don't need to take me through the thorough routine of it, but how did it work, you and Dan writing music together, him playing the piano, you just spitballing ideas with the lyrics? How does that work? We'd, the, two songs in the show were lyrics first, which was If I Met Myself Again and It Means Beautiful, where I had the idea, we were trying to figure out how to make the songs work. If I met myself again, we wrote so many versions of different songs for that bit and it never worked. In the end, I was like, I'm just going to go off and figure something out. It Means Beautiful came from an idea of Jonathan, the director's, where he said, Jamie, in Arabic, would be Jamil, and Jamil means beautiful. And the pretty says to him, your name, it means beautiful. So you wrote those without music? Yeah, I wrote the lyrics first. What was going on in your head then? uh, Melodyless lyrics, how does that work? You just work out what the character's trying to say. Um... I suppose it's sort of like writing a poem, except it isn't really because a poem is a complete piece, whereas a lyric is half a song. Um, I, I don't know. It just just sort of think about who they are, and I suppose it depends what mood I'm in. Like it means beautiful doesn't overly rhyme. It's quite plain, um, which is quite hard to write actually because you can't really hide behind sort of tricks. Whereas if I met myself again, which is also very sort of wears its heart on its sleeve but the rhyme scheme is much more complicated for that so I was obviously in the mood for a more of a challenge more of a crossword puzzle doing that one but then with the other song so like he's my boy we knew we wanted that as the line 
because that was from the documentary and that's it and we were uh staying in this place in france and dan said i, I want to have a tinkle with the piano so me and johnny went off for a walk and we came back an hour later and dan said well i wrote two songs and i couldn't decide which was better so i've put them together and then he played um he's my boy la 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 he's my boy la 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 he's my boy and he just la 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 through with with the he's my boy where he wanted it to go i then took that away so i recorded it on my phone um, and then I took that away and in London then wrote the lyric and then I wanted to have a middle eight well it was longer than, than eight bars but quite mm. a big middle section so I wrote that without having any tune uh, which was uh, Don't Tell Me I'm Fooling Myself Falling Again that bit and in the end I wasn't sure how to end it and I wanted it to kind of wind down so I then wrote again without any tune the is my voice is my chance is my smile is my day is my life is my pain is my joy is my baby is my man is my boy uh, and sent that back to Dan and said, can you put a tune on that? And actually, I think the reason why the song works so well is that ending where it fades out. That's what really gets people. And so it was a back and forth between the two of us. And then we, in the workshop, we realized that we had a verse longer than we needed. And Josie Walker, who originated the role, she actually said, I, I, I don't feel I can hold the audience for this verse. I think it's one too many. It's always great when an actor actually comes to you and says, I want you to cut my lines because I think we don't need it. And then you think, well, that, that must be right then because actors like to hang on to their lines. So it just it evolved very easily, but there were several stages to it. Let's just very quickly pick apart some of the way that you write the lyrics, particularly when they're funny. I was listening on the way over to the, the, the first song and you don't even know it. And there's a the line in there which, which made me laugh again um, in a wonder bra and you don't even know it. Can you talk to me about that process writing jokes in lyrics which have which have to feed the meter of a of a tempo um well i am quite funny i think that's kind of my default setting uh and if i get into that kind of zone then it just kind of comes out but i just go off for a run and i'd think i need about 40 minutes to figure this out so i go off for 40 minutes and by the time i came back i'd have worked it out you just run through options in your head i do have a rhyming app in my phone which can be very useful it doesn't tend to solve problems but it can point you in a direction that you maybe not as we all as humans fall into patterns of using similar words yeah. and even as a writer where i think my vocabulary is probably pretty wide i have a certain vocal pattern and and there's sort of ticks of my speech and sometimes so if i'm writing something i have a thesaurus app as well and i guess there's certain words that i have as go-to words and so i'll if i'm aware that i'm using one of my go-to words in a lyric or in a line of dialogue then i might just look in the thesaurus and see if there's something there that isn't quite so me and by putting that in it it just it tricks my ear enough to make me interested and then it, it can take you off in an interesting direction what are your go-to words uh, there's there's loads but i'm i'm aware when i write um the that there are things that I fall back on. But I mean, I, that, I mean, I'm talking about hundreds of things, probably things that I don't know if anyone else would particularly notice, but I'm aware of. Um, I, I, I do use, I've used the l- winning a lot, I realised in, in Jamie. It crops up quite a few times. Uh, uh, and uh, and it was in it a few more times, and I realised I was using it a lot, so I kind of cut it out. Um, but it's just, it's good to kind of, because sometimes someone will express something, like a real person, in a way that's sort of so perfectly them. And trying to figure out ways to, to make a character that doesn't exist and is really just an extension of you have the same ability to almost like surprise you by the way they articulate something. But I think it, it, just running things through a thesaurus is really helpful. Lastly, uh, with a, a stage show and with a musical more than anything else, uh, it, it's constantly being reworked by someone else. When you write a novel it's going to be pretty much that way forever. Whereas when well, you're when writing you write a, music- a novel, it's reworked by everyone who reads it every it, time they read it. it you, no, you, you it, exactly. But you, but, but you don't really have a, um, a, 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 you don't really have a say in what they're doing and they keep it to themselves quite often. Whereas with a musical, you hand it over to our director who can completely change it. How much, how okay are you with letting this baby free? Well, Jonathan, Jonathan, Dan and I created it and Jonathan's directed the stage show and Jonathan's directed the movie. Uh, and it's our, it's still the three of us there on set every day. So it's always been us. That's not the same with everything. And there's lots of things I've done where I've, where I've let go. But that's right, because unless you're going to direct it yourself, which isn't always the best thing to do anyway, because then, you know, I talk about getting into sort of patterns of dialogue, that sometimes I'll write something that I think is going to be said a certain way. And then an actor 
under you know the guidance of a director would do it really very differently and that actually makes it all much more interesting because they don't know what i thought it was supposed to be Uh, and sometimes i'll go and say actually i think it needs to be like this because it's better that way and there's reasons for it but generally it it tends to work that stuff changes so to hand it over is what makes it come alive i don't have I, i i watched one of the very first tv shows i ever wrote the other day i found it on youtube and i sat down and watched it it was awful but there was a one joke and I thought it was a really good joke. And the actor completely... Can I swear on this? Yeah. They completely fucked it up. <laughs> and I don't know what the hell they were thinking of. It was so simple. All they had to do was literally say the line. And they decided to do it in a German accent. And I don't know what possessed them because it killed it. And that sort of thing, I would have been like running and going, just say it how it's written. Other stuff... Actors will get laughs out of things I never really thought were funny, or they'll get a huge laugh out of something I thought was a bit funny. Um, one of the, the, the one of my favourite jokes in Jamie was about him trying to kind of come out as a drag queen to his best friend, Pretty, who's this very sort of studious, modest Muslim girl in a hijab. And and the way he explains it, he says, remember when we were little, we used to play dress up, and I'd always be Carol Vorderman. And the, the, it's supposed to be, she, and, and Pretty would go or Moira Stewart, and he'd say, depending on mood, yes. And the joke for me was, Moira Stewart, depending on mood, yes. But the Carol Vorderman line always got such a big laugh that you lost the Moira Stewart line, so sorry, Moira. (laughs) I cut it, and Carol Vorderman, that I thought was the setup to the joke, became the punchline. I didn't know that was going to be the case. Um, So you're you're always kind of discovering things. So with Jamie, it's unusual because the three people that created it have control of it still. Uh, And collectively, we are the barometers of all things Jamie. But when it's not that and you hand it over, I don't think that's something to be scared of. And that is it for this week's Writer's Routine. Thank you so much for Tom for coming on the show, telling us all about everybody's talking about Jamie. It's still playing at the West End, and I think they've just finished shooting the movie. I think they've just wrapped on it. Maybe not. I know they're wrapping on it soon. Uh, Tom was back in the UK because he lives in LA now. Uh, He was back over in the UK writing and and helping to make the Jamie movie, which you you can surely see soon. So thank you so much for Tom for for coming on the show. Uh, Now, next week, I don't think we'll have an episode because it's my birthday. I know. Thank you. I'm quite self-indulgent like that. I tend to take a very, very long birthday. But at least I'm not the queen. At least I only have one. Hey, if you want to give me a present... Maybe you can support the show over at Patreon. I'm only joking, but, you know, I wouldn't say no. Uh, When we do come back, it'll be in a couple of weeks' time with a debut rom-com novelist, so make sure you stick around for that. Uh, Yes, also, if you can support the show on Patreon, please do. Leave us a review on Apple Podcasts if that's how you listen to the show, and you can get updates uh, and motivational quotes and tips from some of our best authors every day by following us on Instagram, it's Writer's Routine, and Twitter, Writer's Pod on there. Uh, and I will see you next time in a couple of weeks. Well, I'll be like literally another year older. Oh, it's also going so quickly. Anyway, I'll see you then next time on Writer's Routine. Bye. Bye.